Chapter 8, Part A of The Wealth of Nations, Book 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Book 4, Chapter 8, Part A. Conclusion of the Mercantile System. Though the encouragement of exportation and the discouragement of importation are the two great engines by which the mercantile system proposes to enrich every country, yet with regard to some particular commodities, it seems to follow an opposite plan, to discourage exportation and to encourage importation. Its ultimate object, however, it pretends, is always the same, to enrich the country by an advantageous balance of trade. It discourages the exportation of the materials of manufacture and of the instruments of trade in order to give our own workmen an advantage, and to enable them to undersell those of other nations in all foreign markets, and by restraining, in this manner, the exportation of a few commodities of no great price, it proposes to occasion a much greater and more valuable exportation of others. It encourages the importation of the materials of manufacture in order that our own people may be enabled to work them up more cheaply, and thereby prevent a greater and more valuable importation of the manufactured commodities. I do not observe, at least in our statute book, any encouragement given to the importation of the instruments of trade. When manufacturers have advanced to a certain pitch of greatness, the fabrication of the instruments of trade becomes itself the object of a great number of very important manufactures. To give any particular encouragement to the importation of such instruments would interfere too much with the interest of those manufactures. Such importation, therefore, instead of being encouraged, has frequently been prohibited. Thus the importation of wool cards, except from Ireland, or when brought in as wreck or prize goods, was prohibited by the third of edward the fourth which prohibition was renewed by the thirty-ninth of elizabeth and has been continued and rendered perpetual by subsequent laws the importation of the materials of manufacture has sometimes been encouraged by an exemption from the duties to which other goods are subject and sometimes by bounties the importation of sheep's wool from several different countries of cotton wool from all countries of undressed flax of the greater part of dyeing drugs of the greater part of undressed hides from ireland or the british colonies of sealskins from the british greenland fishery of pig and bar iron from the british colonies as well as of several other materials of manufacture has been encouraged by an exemption from all duties if properly entered at the custom house the private interest of our merchants and manufacturers may perhaps have extorted from the legislature these exemptions as well as the greater part of our other commercial regulations. They are, however, perfectly just and reasonable, and if, consistently with the necessities of the state, they could be extended to all the other materials of manufacture, the public would certainly be a gainer. The avidity of our great manufacturers, however, has in some cases extended these exemptions a good deal beyond what can justly be considered as the rude materials of their work by the twenty fourth of george the second chap forty six a small duty of only one pence the pound was imposed upon the importation of foreign brown linen yarn instead of much higher duties to which it had been subjected before namely of sixpence the pound upon sail yarn of one shilling the pound upon all french and dutch yarn and of two pound thirteen shillings fourpence upon the hundred weight of all spruce or muscovia yarn but our manufacturers were not long satisfied with this reduction by the twenty-ninth of the same king chap fifteen the same law which gave a bounty upon the exportation of british and irish linen of which the price did not exceed eighteen pence the yard even this small duty upon the importation of brown linen yarn was taken away in the different operations however which are necessary for the preparation of linen yarn a good deal more industry is employed than in the subsequent operation of preparing linen cloth from linen yarn to say nothing of the industry of the flax growers and flax dressers three or four spinners at least are necessary in order to keep one weaver in constant employment and more than four-fifths of the whole quantity of labor necessary for the preparation of linen cloth is employed in that of linen yarn but our spinners are poor people, women commonly scattered about in all different parts of the country, without support, 
or protection. It is not by the sale of their work, but by that of the complete work of the weavers, that our great master manufacturers make their profits. As it is their interest to sell the complete manufacture as dear, so it is to buy the materials as cheap as possible. By extorting from the legislature bounties upon the exportation of their own linen, high duties upon the importation of all foreign linen, and a total prohibition of the home consumption of some sorts of French linen, they endeavor to sell their own goods as dear as possible. By encouraging the importation of foreign linen yarn, and thereby bringing it into competition with that which is made by our own people, they endeavor to buy the work of the poor spinners as cheap as possible. They are as intent to keep down the wages of their own weavers, as the earnings of the poor spinners, and it is by no means for the benefit of the workmen that they endeavor either to raise the price of the complete work, or to lower that of the rude materials. It is the industry which is carried on for the benefit of the rich and the powerful, that is principally encouraged by our mercantile system. That which is carried on for the benefit of the poor and the indigent, is too often either neglected or oppressed. Both the bounty upon the exportation of linen, and the exemption from the duty upon the importation of foreign yarn, which were granted only for fifteen years, but continued by two different prolongations, expire with the end of the session of Parliament which shall immediately follow the 24th of June, 1786. The encouragement given to the importation of the materials of manufacture by bounties has been principally confined to such as were imported from our American plantations. The first bounties of this kind were those granted about the beginning of the present century, upon the importation of naval stores from America. Under this denomination were comprehended timber fit for masts, yards, and bowsprits, hemp, tar, pitch, and turpentine. The bounty, however, of one pound the ton upon masting timber, and that of six pounds the ton upon hemp, were extended to such as should be imported into England from Scotland. Both these bounties continued, without any variation, at the same rate, till they were severally allowed to expire. That upon hemp, on the 1st of January, 1741, and that upon masting timber, at the end of the session of Parliament, immediately following the 24th of June, 1781. The bounties upon the importation of tar, pitch, and turpentine, underwent, during their continuance, several alterations. Originally, that upon tar was four pound the ton, that upon pitch the same, and that upon turpentine three pounds the ton. The bounty of four pounds the ton upon tar was afterwards confined to such as had been prepared in a particular manner, that upon other good, clean, and merchantable tar was reduced to two pound four shilling the ton. The bounty upon pitch was likewise reduced to one pound, and that upon turpentine to one pound ten shillings the ton. The second bounty upon the importation of any materials of manufacture, according to the order of time, was that granted by the 21st of George the Second, chap 13, upon the importation of indigo from the British plantations. When the plantation indigo was worth three-fourths of the price of the best French indigo, it was, by this act, entitled to a bounty of sixpence the pound. This bounty, which, like most others, was granted only for a limited time, was continued by several prolongations, but was reduced to fourpence the pound. It was allowed to expire with the end of the session of Parliament, which followed the 25th of March, 1781. The third bounty of this kind was that granted, much about the time that we were beginning sometimes to court and sometimes to quarrel with our American colonies, by the 4th of George the Third, chap 26, upon the importation of hemp or undressed flax from the British plantations. This bounty was granted for 21 years, from the 24th of June, 1764, to the 24th of June, 1785. For the first seven years, it was to be at the rate of eight pounds the ton, for the second, at six pounds the ton, and for the third, at four pounds the ton. It was not extended to Scotland, of which the climate, although hemp is sometimes raised there in small quantities, and of an inferior quality, is not very fit for that produce. Such a bounty upon the importation of Scotch flax in England would have been too great a discouragement to the native produce of the southern part of the United Kingdom. 
the fourth bounty of this kind was that granted by the fifth of george the third chap forty five upon the importation of wood from america it was granted for nine years from the first of january seventeen sixty six to the first of january seventeen seventy five during the first three years it was to be for every hundred and twenty good deals at the rate of one pound and for every load containing fifty cubic feet of other square timber at the rate of twelve shillings for the second three years it was for deals to be at the rate of fifteen shillings and for other square timber at the rate of eight shillings and for the third three years it was for deals to be at the rate of ten shillings and for every other square timber at the rate of five shillings the fifth bounty of this kind was that granted by the ninth of george the third chap thirty eight upon the importation of raw silk from the british plantations it was granted for twenty one years from the first of january seventeen seventy to the first of january seventeen ninety one for the first seven years it was to be at the rate of twenty five pounds for every hundred pounds value for the second at twenty pounds and for the third at fifteen pounds the management of the silkworm and the preparation of silk requires so much hand labor and labor is so very dear in america that even this great bounty i have been informed was not likely to produce any considerable effect the sixth bounty of this kind was that granted by the eleventh of george the third chap fifty for the importation of pipe hogsheads and barrel staves and leading from the british plantations it was granted for nine years from the first of january seventeen seventy two to the first of january seventeen eighty one for the first three years it was for a certain quantity of each to be at the rate of six pounds for the second three years at four pounds and for the third three years at two pounds the seventh and last bounty of this kind was that granted by the nineteenth of george the third chap thirty seven upon the importation of hemp from ireland it was granted in the same manner as that for the importation of hemp and undressed flax from america for twenty one years from the twenty fourth of june seventeen seventy nine to the twenty fourth of june eighteen hundred the term is divided likewise into three periods of seven years each and in each of those periods the rate of the irish bounty is the same with that of the american it does not however like the american bounty extend to the importation of undressed flax it would have been too great a discouragement to the cultivation of that plant in great britain when this last bounty was granted the british and irish legislatures were not in much better humour with one another than the british and american had been before but this boon to ireland it is to be hoped has been granted under more fortunate auspices than all those to america the same commodities upon which we thus gave bounties when imported from america were subjected to considerable duties when imported from any other country the interest of our american colonies was regarded as the same with that of the mother country their wealth was considered as our wealth whatever money was sent out to them it was said came all back to us by the balance of trade and we could never become a farthing the poorer by any expense which we could lay out upon them they were our own in every respect and it was an expense laid out upon the improvement of our own property and for the profitable employment of our own people it is unnecessary i apprehend at present to say anything further in order to expose the folly of a system which fatal experience has now sufficiently exposed had our american colonies really been a part of great britain those bounties might have been considered as bounties upon production and would still have been liable to all the objections to which such bounties are liable but to no other the exportation of the materials of manufacture is sometimes discouraged by absolute prohibitions and sometimes by high duties our woollen manufacturers have been more successful than any other class of workmen in persuading the legislature that the prosperity of the nation depended upon the success and extension of their particular business they have not only obtained a monopoly against the consumers by an absolute prohibition of importing woollen cloths from any foreign country but they have likewise obtained another monopoly against the sheep farmers and growers of wool by a similar prohibition of the exportation of live sheep and wool the severity of many of the laws which have been enacted for the security of the revenue is very justly complained of 
as imposing heavy penalties upon actions which, antecedent to the statutes that declared them to be crimes, had always been understood to be innocent. But the cruelest of our revenue laws, I will venture to affirm, are mild and gentle, in comparison to some of those which the clamor of our merchants and manufacturers has extorted from the legislature for the support of their own absurd and oppressive monopolies. Like the laws of Draco, these laws may be said to be all written in blood. By the 8th of Elizabeth, chap. 3, the exporter of sheep, lambs, or rams, was for the first offense to forfeit all his goods forever, to suffer a year's imprisonment, and then to have his left hand cut off in a market town, upon a market day, to be there nailed up, and for the second offense to be adjudged a felon, and to suffer death accordingly. To prevent the breed of our sheep from being propagated in foreign countries seems to have been the object of this law. By the 13th and 14th of Charles the Second, chap. 18, the exportation of wool was made felony, and the exporter subjected to the same penalties and forfeitures as a felon. For the honor of the national humanity, it is to be hoped that neither of these statutes was ever executed. The first of them, however, so far as I know, has never been directly repealed, and Sergeant Hawkins seems to consider it as still in force. It may, however, perhaps be considered as virtually repealed by the twelfth of Charles the Second, chapter 13, section 3, which, without expressly taking away the penalties imposed by former statutes, imposes a new penalty, namely that of twenty shillings for every sheep exported, or attempted to be exported, together with the forfeiture of the sheep, and of the owner's share of the sheep. The second of them was expressly repealed by the seventh and eighth of William the third, chap twenty eight, section four, by which it is declared that, whereas the statute of the thirteenth and fourteenth of King Charles the second made against the exportation of wool, among other things in the said act mentioned, doth enact the same to be deemed felony, by the severity of which penalty the prosecution of offenders hath not been so effectually put in execution be it therefore enacted by the authority aforesaid that so much of the said act which relates to the making the said offence felony be repealed and made void the penalties however which are either imposed by this milder statute or which though imposed by former statutes are not repealed by this one are still sufficiently severe besides the forfeiture of the goods the exporter incurs the penalty of three shillings for every pound weight of wool either exported or attempted to be exported, that is, about four or five times the value. Any merchant or other person convicted of this offence is disabled from requiring any debt or account belonging to him from any factor or other person. Let his fortune be what it will, whether he is or is not able to pay those heavy penalties, the law means to ruin him completely. But as the morals of the great body of the people are not yet so corrupt as those of the contrivers of this statute, I have not heard that any advantage has ever been taken of this clause. If the person convicted of this offence is not able to pay the penalties within three months after judgment, he is to be transported for seven years. And if he returns before the expiration of that term, he is liable to the pains of felony, without benefit of clergy. The owner of the ship, knowing this offence, forfeits all his interest in the ship and furniture. The master and mariners, knowing this offence, forfeit all their goods and chattels, and suffer three months' imprisonment. By a subsequent statute, the master suffers six months' imprisonment. In order to prevent exportation, the whole inland commerce of wool is laid under very burdensome and oppressive restrictions. It cannot be packed in any box, barrel, cask, case, chest, or any other package, but only in packs of leather or pack cloth, on which must be marked on the outside the words wool or yarn, in large letters, not less than three inches long, on pain of forfeiting the same and the package, and eight shillings for every pound weight, to be paid by the owner or packer. It cannot be loaden on any horse or cart, or carried by land within five miles of the coast, but between sunrising and sunsetting, on pain of forfeiting the same, the horses and carriages. The hundred next adjoining to the sea coast, out of or through which the wool is carried or exported, forfeits twenty pounds, if the wool is under the value of ten pounds, and if of greater value, then treble that value, together with treble costs, to be sued for within the year. 
the execution to be against any two of the inhabitants, whom the sessions must reimburse, by an assessment on the other inhabitants, as in the cases of robbery. And if any person compounds with the hundred for less than this penalty, he is to be imprisoned for five years, and any other person may prosecute. These regulations take place through the whole kingdom. But in the particular counties of Kent and Sussex, the restrictions are still more troublesome. Every owner of wool within ten miles of the seacoast must give an account in writing, three days after shearing, to the next officer of the customs, of the number of his fleeces, and of the places where they are lodged. And before he removes any part of them, he must give the like notice of the number and weight of the fleeces, and of the name and abode of the person to whom they are sold, and of the place to which it is intended they should be carried. No person within fifteen miles of the sea, in the said counties, can buy any wool before he enters into bond to the king, that no part of the wool which he shall so buy shall be sold by him to any other person within fifteen miles of the sea. If any wool is found carrying towards the seaside in the said counties, unless it has been entered and security given as aforesaid, it is forfeited and the offender also forfeits three shillings for every pound weight. If any person lay any wool, not entered as aforesaid, within fifteen miles of the sea, it must be seized and forfeited. And if, after such seizure, any person shall claim the same, he must give security to the exchequer, that if he is cast upon trial he shall pay treble costs besides all other penalties. When such restrictions are imposed upon the inland trade, the coasting trade, we may believe, cannot be left very free. Every owner of wool, who carrieth or causeth to be carried, any wool to any port or place on the sea coast, in order to be from thence transported by sea to any other place or port on the coast, must first cause an entry thereof to be made at the port from whence it is intended to be conveyed, containing the weight, marks, and number of the packages, before he brings the same within five miles of that port, on pain of forfeiting the same, and also the horses, carts, and other carriages, and also of suffering and forfeiting, as by the other laws in force against the exportation of wool. This law, however, first of William the Third, chapter 32, is so very indulgent as to declare that this shall not hinder any person from carrying his wool home from the place of shearing, though it be within five miles of the sea, provided that in ten days after shearing, and before he remove the wool, he do under his hand certify to the next officer of the customs the true number of fleeces and where it is housed, and do not remove the same without certifying to such officer under his hand his intention so to do three days before. Bond must be given that the wool to be carried coastways is to be landed at the particular port for which it is entered outwards, and if any part of it is landed without the presence of an officer, not only the forfeiture of the wool is incurred, as in other goods, but the usual additional penalty of three shillings for every pound weight is likewise incurred. Our woolen manufacturers, in order to justify their demand of such extraordinary restrictions and regulations, confidently asserted that English wool was of a peculiar quality, superior to that of any other country, that the wool of other countries could not without some mixture of it be wrought up into any tolerable manufacture that fine cloth could not be made without it that england therefore if the exportation of it could be totally prevented could monopolize to herself almost the whole woollen trade of the world and thus having no rivals could sell at what price she pleased and in a short time acquire the most incredible degree of wealth by the most advantageous balance of trade this doctrine, like most other doctrines which are confidently asserted by any considerable number of people, was, and still continues to be, most implicitly believed by a much greater number, by almost all those who are either unacquainted with the woolen trade, or who have not made particular inquiries. It is, however, so perfectly false, that English wool is in any respect necessary for the making of fine cloth, that it is altogether unfit for it. Fine cloth is made altogether of Spanish wool. English wool cannot be even so mixed with Spanish wool as to enter into the composition without spoiling and degrading, in some degree, the fabric of the cloth. End of Book 4, Chapter 8, Part A